We are gonna jump into our foundational scripture today in the book of Ephesians chapter six. Maybe you have a Bible with you. You can open it up, turn to Ephesians six. If you are following along on a device, go ahead and flip there now, or you can look at the side screens and we will have the scripture up there for you. We're gonna start with Ephesians six, verses 10 and 11. It says, finally, say finally. finally. Anybody ever had a finally moment? This is, a, this is Paul's finally moment. Finally, he says, last thing I wanna tell you, as he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now pause there. Y'all know, you have heard us say it a lot. It's great, it's great to be able to be physically strong, but there is no kind of strength like being strong in the Lord. Amen? Paul's not saying, well, I want you to bulk up. He's not saying, church, bulk up. He's saying, get strong in the Lord. He makes that reference, because sometimes we get confused, right? Like we all sometimes get a little confused. He said, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He says, put on the full armor of God. And then he says those two words there. Y'all know I like words. He said, so that. So what he is saying there is if you put on the full armor of God, then you will be able to stand against the devil's Evil schemes. Anybody in here ever been familiar with some of the devil's silly little tricks and attacks and trials and frustrations, aggravations, annoyances, aggravations that he throws our way? Some of those days include moments where we not just read that phrase, devil no not today, but where we more shout, devil no not today. Anybody had any of those days where you literally find yourself whispering internally, not today? Well, I have, we have four kids. I say I, we both have them. We have them both, but you know, they more, they more, they more for, fall on me. I get them into the car and things like that. He's very helpful. We have four children <laughs> together, collectively, as a family, there's six of us. We have four children. There's one of them, that's right. She's very helpful though. We have four children, and the time in our lives that I end up saying, devil no not today, is pretty much any day that I'm trying to get those four lovely children to the car for a specific time and a specific purpose all at once without ripping my hair out or any of us losing our sanity. Anybody know what I'm talking about at all? Am I alone? Those moments are the moments where I say, not today, devil, or I get in the car and I yell, not today, devil, and the kids go, me? No. I, I'm like, not you, it's okay. Maybe your situation is lighthearted like that. Maybe the devil not today moments are lighthearted like that, but maybe the situation that you are facing, the trial that you're facing is a fight for your life. Maybe the trial that you're facing is a fight for your marriage, for your family, for a, a child that has moved in a different direction away from God. Maybe your fight is just to pay your mortgage so you can keep your home. But whatever your situation is, the goal is the same. Paul said the goal is to stand and to stand strong in the Lord. You guys hear us week after week banging our feet around up here on this stage because there is great strength in standing. Sometimes we have to stand in the face of things trying to knock us over. Sometimes we just gotta stand up and say, I'm not gonna sit down to this any longer. Doesn't matter what comes at me, I'm not gonna take it laying down, I'm standing up. And Paul said here, the goal, the key of us being able to stand is this full armor of God. Now the issue is, the issue that I have found is that sometimes when we talk about the full armor of God, sometimes when we read this scripture, sometimes when we hear people say it, Sometimes we cannot get a Roman guard dressed up in a huge, big, metal, clunky outfit out of our minds that looks a little something like this, right? Sometimes we get kind of stuck thinking, yeah, I can't wear that. I can't put that on. There's no way that I can not absolutely pass out in this Houston heat wearing that, right? And I think we get stuck and we put this armor of God over in a box on a shelf that says, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's an old thing. It's an old thing we used to talk about. But this is not at all what Paul was talking about. 
It was the Apostle Paul that wrote this book in the Bible, and it is a letter to the church at that time. So in this time period, Paul is actually in prison. There was a period there. He was in prison, and then he was under house arrest. So in this period, he is literally imprisoned for his faith. And he is the leader of the Christian church all around that area. That's why he's an apostle. Multiple gatherings of believers look to him to know how to follow after Jesus. So in this moment, he is in prison for the very thing he's been telling them to do, follow after Jesus, and he lands in jail. So he finds himself in this spot, knowing that the church is bound to be discouraged. And he says, I... I've gotta encourage them, I've gotta write, I've gotta help them say, don't worry about me, everything is, everything is well with my soul, be encouraged. And he recognizes he has these Roman guards, ones that look just like that, all around him all the time. And I'm sure he had extra time on his hands. So he recognized all of this armor that everyone was familiar with, that they knew, why do the soldiers wear this? They wear it to stay safe, to stay protected. And he wanted to draw a parallel between this physical armor that the Roman soldiers wore at the time to the spiritual armor that we have to protect us, that we have in Christ. So he didn't want the church to be discouraged. And he said, the best way I know how to tell you to not be discouraged is to tell you, you've got access to this armor You've got access to this thing that's gonna keep you safe. I may be in prison right now, I may be going through something right now, but I am still protected by the Most High God. Anybody ever been going through something and able to recognize God's still protecting me? I'm still winning this battle even though it doesn't look like it's going in my favor. I'm still winning. And that's what Paul was saying to the church in this letter, in this book of the Bible. He wanted them to take a stand. He wanted them to stomp their feet like I'm encouraging you today. He wanted them to stand strong. And he said the answer is that we have to put on the full armor of God. Now, how many of you know that the full armor of God the armor of it, we only say full because we literally mean it's, it's best all in combination. I mean, you can take one piece of it and it'll be great, but if you put the whole thing on, you'll be even more protected, right? How many of you know that the armor of God is wonderfully helpful in moments of trial, in moments of struggle, but it is most helpful if you put it on before the trial, before the struggle, right? It is necessary. This is why we say put on the armor of God every single day. Because y'all, we don't know what waits for us in this day, right? We expect favor in every situation. We expect the blessings of God in every situation. But we do have an enemy that does desire to steal, kill, and destroy every ounce of joy in our lives, right? He doesn't have access to all of them. But we arm ourselves before, right? So I was driving my kiddos, this was, I don't know, it was probably a year ago or so, and I was taking three of them to pick up one of the other ones. And I was driving along, and y'all, I will humbly admit, I was driving and I was a little distracted, okay? I was distracted, I wasn't paying full attention for just a moment, I'm sure I'm the only one that has ever done that, (laughs) all by myself, but to the officers in the room, I apologize. I was distracted, I will humbly admit it. I got distracted for a moment. I had three kids in the back of the car who knows what they were saying, doing, wanting. For a moment, I took my eyes off of the road. I did. I didn't hit anybody, okay? I didn't run into any cars, I didn't run into anything. I'm not the one that ran into Pastor Daniel's Jeep. That wasn't me. (laughs) I didn't hit anything. But for a moment, I did take my eyes off of the road. And in that particular moment, I missed something a little pivotal Um, I missed that little sign that said I was heading into a school zone and I needed to slow down. I missed it. I literally missed it altogether. I looked away. It passed. I looked up, didn't know it passed. So I just continued the speed that I was going and I didn't recognize that I was the only one driving the fastest um, until I saw the wonderful little white constable parked right up in front of me and I thought, oh no, this is a school zone. 
don't. So what did I do? I hit the brakes, right? Logic. I slowed down because I knew that was what I was supposed to do in that moment. And slowing down was the right thing to do, y'all. But how many of you know that it wasn't, it wasn't early enough? I didn't quite do it in time, and I recognized that when I saw the flashing lights and heard the sirens come in to pull me over. And yes, it was a great moment because I did hit my brakes, and it was, it was important, but I did not hit them before I got in trouble. And so often, we put the armor of God into the same category where we say, I know it's good, I know it's important, but um, I've got other things to do, I'm a little distracted right now, until, oh no, I'm in trouble, I need the armor of God. You're already in the mess, you're already in it. You're already in the spot. It doesn't mean that prayer doesn't work in the moment. It does, but it's so much more helpful if I would have hit the brakes before I got pulled over. I wouldn't have even had to go through all of that because the constable would have just, he wouldn't even have noticed me. The same is true for the armor of God. We must apply it before we are stuck in a situation. I love how Paul breaks the armor down in Ephesians 6, verses 14 through 17. He says, stand firm then, right? There's those same words that I love. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I love what Paul is saying here and the simplicity of it is simply this. He's not saying buckle up with the belt, put on a breastplate, put on a helmet. He's not saying walk around like that. What he is saying is, There are these key elements that we have in Christ. They are truth. They are righteousness. They are peace. They are faith. They are salvation, the word of God. And if we surround our lives every single day with those, we will walk around protected because we know what the word of God says as truth. We understand the power You know, when we talk about uh, living in a bubble as Christians, typically it's referred to in a negative way, right? But this type of bubble is different. This type of bubble places us in a posture where I am living my life focused on his truth. I'm living my life focused on his righteousness. I am living my life focused on his strength and not my own. That is the value in this armor. But here's the thing. This armor of ours is not a sloppy, one-size-fits-all costume that we're all forced to wear, right? Nobody asked you to slip into a costume before you came in here, right? If they did, let me know their name, because I do want to know who that was. We don't do that, okay? That is not the armor of God. It is not just one thing will fit everyone. That is not how God works, speaking of which. So y'all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on myself here for a minute. I do a lot of online shopping. Anybody an online shopper? There you go, there we go, okay. I don't like to go into the stores. I told you I have four kids. I don't have time to go into stores. So I I know all the husbands are like, but come on, come on. Encourage me too, not just, not just the wives in the room. No, I mean, I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not overspending. But where I do my shopping is online, okay? So I typically, I'm typically the responsible party for the one who picks out Pastor Daniel's clothes if they're not Hope City gear, okay? <laughs> not, his, not his feet, okay? His shoe game is all him, okay? But I, I carry this little bit of a level of cockiness that I, it's, we've been married 19 years now. We celebrated 19 years of marriage. <laughs> I know this man, okay? So I feel pretty confident that I can order something online and I got this, I got this, honey. He'll be like, you sure? And I'm like, honey, 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 I got this, I got you. So as we were heading into this new series, you know, his last message was um, update your outfit. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna update your outfit, all right? So I got him, I got him a few extra pairs of pants just, just for life and we got them. And I, I'm, not, I'm not overly cocky, okay? I'm not overly arrogant about it fitting him. So I was like, honey, could you go try all these on? I just, I wanna make sure that they do fit. I'm pretty sure that they will, but I wanna make sure that they do. 
So he very kindly, because he's always like, no, not right now. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I want to know. So he goes and he tries them on. He tries on the first couple pair. And I'm like, uh-huh, yes, I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then I pull out the final pair and I open them up and I pull them out. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about, okay, let's just go ahead and try it on. Just give it a shot, honey. And he's like, you sure? I'm like, yeah, 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 go try these on. So he kindly goes and puts these pants on. And y'all, when he comes out to me and the children who just happened to be in the same room, he looks at me with a, why have you betrayed me, wife? <laughs> sort of look on his face. Not a what do you think look, more like how could you? I thought you loved me. You ordered these to embarrass me in front of our kids? This is a sick joke. But see, the issue was, um, it wasn't that, that, that they didn't technically fit him. Technically, technically, see, he, he even said it. He said they did, they did fit. Technically, they fit him. But technically, they were women's. So I got a, part, a portion of it right. I got it, it fit, but they were definitely up to about here on him. Now, I can, wear, I can wear the high pants. They don't look as great on a gentleman. And they had the little pleats down the front and the little... Oh, it was, it was, I'm his biggest fan, but even I was like, get those off. Just take them off. I am sorry. I love you. Forgive me. Forgive me. Let's not hold this in my track record. But in this moment, we realized that there is a big difference between something that is technically custom fit and something that just might fit, Right? Something that is custom fit to you is going to be very different than something that just is a one size fits all. And the armor of God is meant to be the same way. The armor of God is meant to be custom fit for you. Fitted to your heart, fitted to your personality, fitted to your gifting and your uniqueness that God designed specifically. And as you pray, say, as I pray. As, I pray. as you pray, y'all, this is the important part. As you pray for his truth to be fitted around your waist like a belt, it's not that he changes truth. Y'all, truth is truth is truth is truth all day long. Same thing for his righteousness. It never changes. But the truth is that when we pray for the armor of God to be our protection, he changes you. When you pray and ask him for his armor to cover you, he changes you in the process. He changes you in the moment. He changes you to see his truth. Because how many of you know we can walk around life with a whole lot of blinders on and not even realize it? He changes you to see his truth. He changes you to be able to embrace his righteousness. He changes you to rest in his peace. Anybody ever experienced a season where rest was really difficult? Sometimes rest can be real hard, but when we pray for his armor to cover us, he changes us to be able to rest in his peace, to be able to walk in faith, to receive his salvation, and to be guided by the word of God. The first thing and the most important thing that I want you to write down and take home today is point number one. Write this down. The armor of God changes you. The armor of God protects us because he changes us to be more like him. The more aware of him we are. That bubble that I talked to you about, that bubble of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God, that bubble, the more we live in that bubble, the more we are aware of the goodness of God. So many things are gonna be happening everywhere. It doesn't mean you don't live in the world. He says for us to be a part of the world, but we find strength in our awareness of the goodness of God, amen? There's a story that I want to remind you of. Um, it's not a story that's probably gonna be all that new to you. It's about a young man in the Bible. 
And this young man encountered a moment where he recognized the devil's schemes and he decided to take a stand. You've heard of this young man. This young man, he was often depicted, probably if you were little, if you grew up in church, you might have seen um, a story with a big man and then a little young boy. And there was a great fight between these two. And you can remember them. It is David and... Goliath. We are talking about a story that you know, but do not check out because maybe you're like, yeah, I know the story. I know this one. Yeah, you do know it, but I want you to hear it from a different perspective for just a moment. There was something so significant about this battle. It was the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. The Israelites believed wholeheartedly in the one true living God. The Philistines did not. And that was often where the battle lied, was who was the living God, and they were at odds. And they were fighting over this, okay? So there is this big, he's, he was a bully. Goliath was nine feet tall, nine inches. He was a big man and he was a bully. So every day for 40 days, the Israelites and the Philistines came up to these battle lines that were drawn and the Israelites thought we're gonna get to unify and stand strong together. And Goliath came out to that battle line and he said, laughing in their faces, criticizing our God, criticizing their strength. He said, I will fight one of you to end this today. If one of you can defeat me, and he laughed with his deep, like, I try to do it, but my deep laugh is not that, it's not that deep. It's more like, ha, 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 ha. Pretty good. I, I imagine it being a lot more intimidating than that, but you got it. He laughed and he criticized them and he said, if one of you can defeat me, and then he did that evil like laugh that's saying, we all know you can't. If one of you can defeat me, then we Philistines will be servants to you Israelites. But if I win, then you all, you all are defeated for good. So every time he stood up and said that for 40 days, the Israelite men, grown men, trembled at this idea and said, yeah, okay, we're not, I'm not, not, not me, not me, not me. And they look around and say, who's gonna step up? So for 40 days, they were at a standstill. So over these 40 days, in comes David, because David's not on the battle lines, but his brothers are. And his father is like, it's been 40 days, like, I, I need an update. David has been out in the field taking care of the sheep, and David's dad says, hey, I want you to take some snacks down to the battle lines. Pastor Daniel's convinced. We've discussed this often. He's convinced it was Funyuns and Cheez-Its that David was supposed to take down. And I'm like, no, babe. It's not snacks of the time. It's not snacks of anybody's time, really. Nobody should be eating those. Nobody should. But everybody loves a good snack, right? Doesn't matter if you are a woman, a man, a kid. We all love a good snack. Can I get an amen? amen. David's, man, uh, David's father was a smart man. So he sent him with snacks, appropriate snacks, to go and figure out what was going on and report back to him. So David gets down there to the battle line and he hears Goliath taunting the men and he sees the men not stepping up. So in this moment, he recognizes the attack of the enemy and he says, if none of y'all are gonna stand up, I'm gonna stand up. And so this is where I want you to jump into the story in the Bible. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 40, where David says to King Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, that was him, he said, I will go and fight him. And King Saul replied, and he said, oh, no, 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 you, you're not able to go. You're not able to, you're just a boy. You're not able to go and fight against this Philistine. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David pushes back. This is where all of your uh, teenage children that you're like, stop pushing back. This was a good moment when they pushed back. So he pushes back here, and he pushes back, and he says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. This is where he begins to testify about his history with God. This is where he says, when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Amen. This young boy 
wasn't asking a question. He was, he was just like Pastor Daniel. He wasn't saying, what do you think? He was saying, no, this won't do. My God will defeat this Philistine. He wasn't saying, maybe, I, let me give it a shot. He said, I know my God. I know our history. I know what he has done. He will allow me to defeat this Philistine. So he says from there, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to him at this point, he said, okay, fine, go, go and the Lord be with you. I think to me, it's kind of like, you know, when people say, oh, God bless you, God bless you. He was like, okay, fine, you're gonna be pushy. Nobody else has clearly succeeded at it. Just Godspeed, go with God. This is a little simple little covering. But then the next thing that he did is where we're gonna rest. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He placed his own custom fit armor on David. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And he told King Saul, I cannot go out in these because I am not used to them. So he took them off and he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, his little shepherd's fanny pack. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. And we know what happened next, right? He took that one stone and he slung it at Goliath and he nailed him in his head and he fell back and he cut off his head and they were defeated, right? Right, it's one of the, the most famous stories in the Bible. So significant, we get so much out of it about the mountain that can be moved, absolutely. But the one question I wanna ask is, if David had the opportunity to wear the king's armor, he had the opportunity to wear the best of the best. There is probably the, the everyday soldier and then there's the king's gear. Like if you're gonna feel protected at all, you're gonna wanna be in the king's gear, right? If you're going to battle, my goodness, if you can get the king's armor, this is a blessing. But David said, no thank you, why? I want you guys to realize from this example that just because something looks safe, just because something sounds like a good idea, just because something worked for somebody else does not make it custom fit for your purpose. Does not make it. We can look all day long at something that seems good, but is it God for you? When you surround yourself with the truth that is found in the armor of God, you will be able to discern that very question. Because if we look at Colossians 2.8, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, meaning convincing you of something that they say is right, is good, is true which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Y'all, point number two, the armor of God is not just a tradition. This is not just a tradition that we talk about. There is great power in the armor of God. Romans 12, two says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every time you pray for that armor of God to cover you and protect you, you are renewing your mind to the protections and the realities of what we have access to in Christ Jesus. And the more we focus on it, the more we will be transformed by it. And this scripture goes on to say, then, then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Y'all, David tested out that armor. It took him one second. He looked at that armor, he put it on, and he said, ah, thank you. That's not gonna work for me because that's not what God said is what I needed to win this battle. There are certain things that God will continually say, I'm arming you, your own little spiritual fanny pack. He's arming you specifically with what you need, but it's so important that you know the difference. There is an armor that's just for you. There's provision that is just for you. They say, just for me, just for me. 
There is a future that's just for you. There is a blessing that is just for you. And these are all found in relationship with our Savior. That relationship grows more with every conversation, with every prayer. Every time you hand over a trial to him, it will grow. And every period of waiting and rewarding, you will grow. David did not need physical armor to fight Goliath, y'all. But don't be confused. He was armed. He was armed well. You have to think less like Texas armadillo type of armor and think more like rainforest, poisonous tree frog. You may not be able to see it, but it's there. Don't confuse it. There is protection there. David carried two very important pieces of this armor in this battle. He was armed with peace, and he was armed with faith. So let's look again at that passage, Ephesians 6, 14 through 17, one more time, where we say, what, stand what? Stand firm. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place. It's hard to say that fast. Y'all should try it sometime. It's not easy. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Y'all, who is the gospel of peace? Jesus, I love that. I love asking that question because some of you are like, well, you're, that's technically a noun and you're talking about a person, so who is it? It's Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. There is only one gospel. There will ever only be one gospel and that is and always will be Jesus Christ alone. So why is it so important that we walk in a readiness prepared with the gospel of peace? That means when we understand what Jesus has done for us, we carry the gospel with us, and it not only changes us, but it empowers us to be able to stand strong in knowing that we're not alone in this battle. We have been given all the tools that we need for it, and it is a safe place in his presence. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Y'all, peace comes when we build our lives on Jesus. How many of you know it is so easy to just build a life and not realize that you just were building something and you were, you were being very flippant about it? Like you can just get busy doing something and not doing it intentionally. We have to intentionally build our lives on Jesus because the peace of God that comes from the gospel, that peace gives us stability, gives us that firm footing that I've been talking about, that firm footing that keeps us steady. One of my favorite scriptures that you have probably heard me say once, twice, a few times, you're gonna hear me say it a lot, is Isaiah 26, three. And it says, you keep him in what kind of peace? Perfect peace. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. That doesn't mean you keep his life perfect. That doesn't mean you keep his life out of any of the stuff that happens in life, but it means you keep his peace purpose perfect because he trusts in you. Y'all, there is something so specific about these feet that Paul referenced It's so specific and important. He said that these feet would be shod, meaning they would have shoes on them, but he referenced the feet more because it was the feet that were being taken care of. It's the feet that was being prepared and protected. And the reason for that is that Roman guy up there that y'all saw on the screen, he had, when he was going into battle, these sandals. They were incredibly gnarly. They had spikes that came out the fronts of them, like that way like this way. So they were not only defensive, but they were offensive as well. There were spikes that went out the front and spikes that went down into the ground so that if these soldiers needed to go after something, they could run at it with these spikes on their feet. That's terrifying, right? Nobody wants somebody running at them with spikes on their feet. And maybe you guys have experienced it. I haven't. It sounds awful. 
okay? The spikes were on the front, but they were also underneath, so that if they ever needed to stand their ground, they could not be moved because the spikes held them in place. Paul wanted us to see this and understand it because he wanted us to realize that the truth of Jesus, the gospel, keeps us steady on our feet. If we are firm in the gospel of Jesus, we don't have to be moved, y'all. We don't have to be moved around by every wind and frustration and aggravation, we can stand firm. This was the importance of those feet. It makes us immovable. And when we find traction in the gospel, we are then ready to move forward in faith, wherever, whenever, however, whatever. That's why he referenced the readiness. Y'all, traction is so important, so important. So our family, we are, I will, I will say it out loud, I'm gonna say it proud, we love Galveston, okay? Yes, 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 yes. I'm sick of this whole either you love Galveston or you don't. We love Galveston, it's ours, it's ours. We love Galveston, we love Galveston. So our family, they're that is something that we love to do. I have people that say, okay, you love Galveston, but do you actually put your kids in the water? Yes! I put my kids in that water. Y'all, it's murky. I see some shoulders shrugging. It's murky, but we love it, okay? We can recognize when it's the wrong kind of murk, and then we stay out, okay? Stay out of that murkiness. But we love Galveston. So we take our kids down there as often as we can. We were down at Galveston one time with all the kids. We were driving around, and we were driving past this area of beach where you could drive out on the beach. And um, we saw out on the beach, there was this couple that was getting married out on the beach at Galveston. They love Galveston, too. <laughs> and we were like, we want to love it with you, so we're going to drive up really close and look at your wedding. I know, when we're on vacation, we kind of stick our noses in things that just are not our business, right? Anybody else? Anybody else? It's like, yeah, I'm just so curious. We're so curious. So we're like, we can discreetly drive down to the beach and tiptoe in our car, and no one will ever notice us. And we'll just watch, because how cool. You're getting married on the beach in Galveston. So we did that. Um, but we weren't as discreet as we thought we were being. So when we drove down onto that Galveston sand that we love, um, we kind of got a little stuck in the sand right there at their wedding. So this wonderful, sweet little, we're just gonna sneak up and like look at your wedding because it's on a public beach, we can, but it's not polite. Um, and we got stuck there. So we were literally stuck trying to get the car unstuck with my sweet husband moving the car back and forth from drive to reverse in the car. I don't make good sound effects, but it was like, rrr, rrr. and their wedding, their wedding is happening right there. We're flinging sand everywhere. I'm like, honey, whatever gear you're using, it's not working. Try another one. I'm crouched down below my seat because of course he pulls up on the passenger side crouched down below the window like, get us out of here, get us out of here. This is awful. We got married. This is terrible. You know that no one should do this. It was in that moment that we realized traction is so important. We needed traction to be able to get out of the mess that we were in. And the peace of God gives us traction, y'all. We needed traction that day on the beach, and we need traction as believers. And the reason that Paul referenced these feet is because he knew we would need that type of traction. And peace increases our faith. The reason that Paul referenced faith as a shield is because this shield that the Roman soldiers carried was huge, it's huge. It was at least four feet tall and super wide. The reason for that is they intended it to cover the entire person of the Roman soldier. So when Paul is referencing this, he's being very specific in that because he wants us to know that our shield of faith, we should be fully covered by it. Your faith will cover you and keep you entirely protected if you allow it to. 
But something that's so important to look at here is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Not by sight, right? So this faith that we hold in front of us, if we are functioning in faith the way that we're supposed to, we're not actually able to look around it to decide whether or not we really should do that or not because we are supposed to follow behind God's leading without adding our two cents in. Amen? If we could see around it, we would decide based on comfort, safety, this is a good idea, instead of just pursuing God's heart and will. Because we don't always know the why behind where God is leading us, but we always know there will be provision. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 says, says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Just like David Peace and faith go together to make us confident. And point number three is that the armor of God gives you confidence. The armor of God gives you confidence to trust God in the situation you're in, in the situation that is to come, to grow every single day knowing that he cares so much for you that he would speak directly to somebody else to help you along your way. We have to put on the armor of God every day. Amen? Would y'all stand to your feet with me? I want to pray over you here. I want to pray specifically for those that are needing more peace with every head bowed and every eye closed. Those that are desiring more peace, greater faith, greater confidence in God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I speak to every single person that can hear the sound of my voice, and I ask you in the name of Jesus to flood them with your peace right now, God. Maybe there's a situation that feels overwhelming. Maybe there is a moment in their life that they are in great need. And I ask you right now, God, that you would show up so big that they would just sense your presence. For those that are desiring greater faith, God, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would allow them to see that next step. And that next step is the only step that they need to worry about, is following and pursuing you in that one moment of trust. And you will increase and grow that mustard seed in their life to help them be able to trust you more. Maybe they're facing something that's really difficult and really hard and they just need to trust that you are fighting for them. Exodus 14, 14 says, you will fight for us. We need only to be still. And I thank you right now for your confidence that comes when we just release control and trust you. I pray, Father, for a a group of people, a body of believers that trust you so wholeheartedly and we have confidence in knowing it doesn't all fall on us when we put it back on you. Surround us, Lord. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want I wanna speak for a moment to those that maybe have never gotten to that helmet of salvation part because you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life or maybe you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you've turned away and gone a totally different direction. Today, I want to remind you that Romans 10, 10 says that if you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. We have a savior that sacrificially, voluntarily went to the cross to give up his life so that we wouldn't have to live in bondage, that we wouldn't have to live in sin, but that we could live a life of freedom and of joy and of hope with a father that greatly loves us. So if you are in this room or you are at one of our other locations or you can hear my voice right now and you would say that I need to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior or I need to rededicate my life, I'm gonna count to three and then I'm gonna ask you to just boldly surrender and boldly lift your hand and boldly confess that I need a Savior. On the count of three, one, two, three, would you lift your hand all across the room? I see you back there. I see you up here. I see you over here and over here. Church, can we celebrate? I see you over there. I see you back there and back there and there and there and here. So amazing. Maybe you lifted your hand. Maybe you didn't lift your hand today, but it is a simple prayer of surrender that comes from a heart of sincerity. So would you all repeat this with me? Would you say, dear God, 
Today is my day of salvation. Today, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and you rose from the grave so that I could live in freedom. Today, I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sins and I turn away. Thank you, Father. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.